Did you ever wonder where life comes from? Well, if you did, you're definitely not alone. Because this is one of the most fundamental questions that humanity has ever posed. And currently, the scientific answer is, we don't really know. But there are some accepted theories out there. Like the idea that all current life on Earth descends from self-replicating molecules of nucleic acid, called RNA. Now, most people have heard of DNA, that it contains our genes and stores information about us, that it's the blueprint of life. But it's exactly because of this characterization that we lose sight of what seems more likely about the origins of life, that it wasn't based on DNA at all, but instead on RNA. So what exactly are these molecules that we think started life? Nucleic acids are one class of biological macromolecules that are found in all living organisms and function primarily in genetic information storage and protein synthesis. The building blocks of nucleic acids are monomeric units called nucleotides, and these building blocks are themselves constructed from three separate components. In every nucleotide, you'll find a five-carbon sugar ring, with each one of the carbon atoms designated a number. The name of the sugar is based on the atoms bound to the two prime carbon position. If you have a hydroxyl group attached, then this is the sugar ribose, used for RNA nucleotides. If you only have a hydrogen attached and lack that one extra oxygen atom, then this is considered deoxyribose, used for DNA nucleotides. But both types will contain a hydroxyl group bound to the three prime carbon, as well as a phosphate group bound to the five prime carbon, located outside the ring structure. This phosphate group is the second required component necessary to make a nucleotide. The last part is a ring structure called a nitrogenous base that's used to name each nucleotide. You'll find one of five different types bound to the one carbon of the sugar ring. Purines are a dual ring structure, either adenine or guanine. Pyrimidines are single rings, either cytosine, thymine, or uracil. In order to make a polymer from these nucleotide building blocks, we have to look specifically at the five and three prime carbon atoms of the sugar ring. As you take one nucleotide and chemically complex it to a second, a dehydration reaction takes place between the three prime bound hydroxyl group of one nucleotide and the five prime bound phosphate group of the other, resulting in the formation of a covalent bond called a phosphodiester bond. This same reaction takes place each time another nucleotide is added, creating a repeating series of sugar and phosphate down the length of the growing molecule, which is called the backbone. You can also see at one end of the molecule, there'll always be a free 5' prime phosphate group. And on the other end of the molecule, there'll always be a free 3' prime hydroxyl group. This allows you to distinguish one end from the other, called the 5 and 3' prime ends. But DNA isn't just one strand of nucleotides. It's two of these long polymers complexed together, which requires that the nitrogenous bases pair up in complementary fashion. For each adenine nucleotide found in one strand, a thymine is required to match it in the other strand. For each guanine nucleotide, a cytosine is needed to match it. Hydrogen bonds are then formed between each pair of bases, two for AT pairs and three for GC pairs. These bonds ultimately hold the two strands together. Since the nitrogenous bases of both strands need to face each other, the strands also have to run in opposite or anti-parallel orientation. In total, these interactions produce a right-handed twisting molecule of two polymers that we call a DNA double helix. The nucleotide building blocks of DNA and RNA contain minor chemical differences that have a major impact, causing DNA to form a stable, non-reactive, and uniformly twisting double helix, which is great for storing important genetic information, but really not much else. Whereas RNA is reactive, chemically flexible, and typically single-stranded. It's this inherent versatility of RNA that positions it as a much more likely candidate to support early life. RNA has two features that provide the key to seeing it as a central biological molecule. First, the building blocks used to create it can store coded information, just like DNA. And second, single-stranded RNA molecules can fold and align regions of nucleotides that have complementary bases. This produces a three-dimensional structure, just like a protein, and it could then be used to catalyze chemical reactions. In modern cells, we use the term ribozyme to indicate these non-coding catalytic RNA molecules. The RNA world hypothesis says that billions of years ago, in the primordial chemical soup of early Earth, RNA molecules formed that had the unique ability to self-replicate without the aid of enzymatic help like we see in cells today. But how do you get something from nothing? 
1952, the landmark Miller-Urey experiment provided support for the chemical origins of life by showing the spontaneous creation of amino acids, which are the building blocks of proteins, just by adding a spark discharge to a mix of gases thought to be found on the early Earth. In that same experiment, high-energy intermediates of prebiotic chemistry were also formed, which could assemble in subsequent reactions into nucleotides, which are the building blocks of genetic material. So, okay, we have the building blocks. Now, can you spontaneously form a molecule? Yeah, you can. RNA nucleotides have been shown to make simple polymers just by using common clay minerals as an attachment site, bringing them close enough together to form bonds. And interestingly, those same clay minerals can be used to catalyze the formation of primitive membranes, possibly bringing them together with RNA molecules to form protocells. So you can imagine this happening naturally in somewhere like a geothermal vent or a volcanic hot spring geyser billions of years ago. This could have led to an RNA molecule that was stable or had some catalytic function, like the ability to self-replicate. And at that point, natural selection would take over, and only the fittest, most catalytic, most replication-competent molecule would increase in the population. But no matter how it happened, there's a lot of evidence showing that current life descends from an RNA-based system. A simple example is the fact that cells don't actually have the ability to generate DNA building blocks. Instead, they create RNA building blocks and enzymatically convert them to the DNA version. Now this supports the idea that a long time ago some random mutations occurred in an RNA molecule that helped to generate DNA. But that's not all. There are many current molecules that are suggested to be relics of an RNA-based world. For example, acetyl-CoA, which is a core molecule of central metabolism. At one end you have the working part, which is a thioester, and on the other side, for no obvious reason, is a nucleotide. Likewise, vitamin B12, an important cellular cofactor, has its functional complex ring structure on one side and a nucleotide on the other side. It's thought that these seemingly arbitrary nucleotides found linked to contemporary molecules could have originally functioned as a type of handle to be incorporated into a catalytic RNA molecule or primitive ribozyme. But there's even more examples from modern cells. We can see the similarity to RNA nucleotides if we look at metabolically active molecules like NAD and FAD, the electron carriers used in cellular respiration, or the energy-producing molecules of the cell like ATP and GTP. These are actually just ribonucleotides with the addition of two more phosphate groups. So not only is there a structural case to be made relating RNA nucleotides to molecules in a cell, but there's also a functional case. RNA is heavily involved in processing and regulating genetic messages within a modern cell. It not only acts as the intermediary messenger molecule of gene transcription, but it's also used to create small catalytic nuclear-based molecules that splice out unimportant sequence from those messages. MicroRNAs are used to target and degrade unwanted or excessive gene transcripts. Transfer RNA is used to read the genetic message and create protein. And the site where protein synthesis takes place, the ribosome, has a catalytic center that's created by RNA. The fact that all proteins in a modern cell are created using a catalytic RNA machine that we call a ribosome provides a dramatic example supporting an early stage of biochemistry dominated by RNA function that was adapted over time to its current form. So we're left with this molecule called RNA that on the surface is often thought of as just a middleman between the important information storage molecule of DNA and all the protein tools of a modern cell. But that forces us to overlook its flexible and adaptive nature, being able to code, splice, build, degrade, replicate, and catalyze. An impressive list of activities that might have all begun billions of years ago with a single self-replicating RNA molecule. And remember, science bonds us.